in the field. We were the Anna at. Where are you? Oh, so let me introduce Anna Bolzer. She's the national organizer for the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, and she has flown in from St. Louis. Well, this from California, and I'm from St. Louis <laughs> to be with us. She's really wonderful, and she has helped create a coalition coalition of 400 groups under her. So she knows what she's talking about. So come on up, Anna. Um, so thank you really very much to Beth and Doug and Jan and all the people who organized this conference. It's really, really exciting when I heard about it. I was thrilled. I said I can't miss this. Um, my mom was up in Boulder, so I like excuses to come by. And, um, and this is really something historic. There aren't statewide BDS conferences happening in that many parts of the country. Um, and so there's something really unique happening here and I want to congratulate you for getting this far and for all the different groups represented here. This is the way coalition building happens and I'll be talking a bit more about my the lessons I've learned in coalition building a little later today. Um, I'll also be doing a BDS training, but the, what I wanted to focus on in this first section and what I was asked to focus on was um, a bit about the history of BDS and what's happening right now in the movement. So I'll be sort of introducing BDS. I'll, I know a lot of you are probably fairly familiar with it, and I'll go somewhat quickly, but about what it's about, the history, the significance of it. Um, talk a bit about the state of the US movement, um, successes, and sort of the climate right now in the United States vis-a-vis -vis BDS. Um, go through some specific campaigns, in particular ones that I know that this community is interested in and maybe already making progress with and then talk very briefly about how maybe what you're doing can fit into the national scene. And I think that'll probably be actually obvious as I, as I talk. And I know that, you know, I, I'm coming from outside here. Um, I like to think of myself as an honorary Coloradan because um, my family's here, but really, uh, really, you know, I come here with humility. This is your local coalition. You will know what's best, sort of how to do things in your local context. So I'm just, you know, offering uh, whatever might be helpful and maybe some things won't be and I'll do my best. Um, okay, so, so in 2005, about 170 Palestinian civil society organizations uh, issued a historic call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, um, against Israel until Israel complies with international law, specifically fulfilling three, the three basic, basic rights of the Palestinian people. Um, and that is, uh, number one, an end to the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, including East Jerusalem. Um, number two, um, the uh, equality for Palestinian citizens inside Israel. And number three, the right of return for Palestinians um, who are living in exile, most of them since 1948, and their um, descendants. Let's, if you can save it for questions, or it might come out, we're going to do a little bit of sort of Q&A as we go. Um, and, uh, and so these are the three rights. We don't do BDS willy-nilly. These are the three rights that Palestinians have asked us um, as the goals of the BDS movement. Um, and so we are accountable to them. When we talk about doing BDS, we can't pick one and sort of dismiss the others. We can focus, let's say, on talking about the occupation, but what's sort of unique about the BDS movement is that it shifted things from only talking about occupation to putting the occupation into a broader context, sort of what, you know, the, the four maps that Ibrahim showed, showing that it's not just about the fourth map, but that this fits into a, a longer process of colonialism. You don't have, this doesn't have to be a part of everything you do with regard to BDS, but very important is that as you, let's say, focus on a settlement product to talk about the occupation, that you never undermine the right of Palestinians to return or, or Palestinians to have equality within Israel. So it just sort of, it sort of, it, it, it sort of brings things together, that things are integrated. And you focus on what is most appropriate for your context, and that might be something focusing on the occupation. Um, okay, but I digress. So BDS, boycott is consumer boycott, things that we think about going to the you know, grocery store, not buying an apple, etc. Um, boycott can also be cultural boycott, it can be academic boycott, and I can describe what those are in a minute. Divestment, so boycotts oftentimes are, especially consumer boycotts, that's something that sort of an individual does one individual at a time. 
Uh, divestment is an institutional thing. So a campus or a church might stop investing in companies involved in the occupation, and that would be an example of divestment. Um, the S for sanctions is something generally governments do, imposing sanctions on another um, state. Um, and uh, like I said, what's, what's, what's great about BDS is that it did shift that narrative um, to talking about the broader rights of Palestinians. Um, and that it really actually, one of the great things about, about BDS is that it brought Palestinians back to the center of their struggle. Of course, Palestinians have always been at the center of their struggle, you know, uh, notably on the ground, resisting for decades and decades. Um, but there's a sort of point of accountability that we're responding to a call from Palestinian civil society. We're not choosing what we think might be helpful to Palestinians. We're listening to them. And they're saying very clearly, not just Palestinians inside the West Bank and Gaza, also Palestinians in 1948 Israel, also Palestinians in the diaspora, including in our country, we're responding to this broad call um, because we trust that Palestinians know best what is right for their freedom struggle. So there's a there's sort of a shift in in um, the sort of overall framework of what it means to be a solidarity activist, and that's really significant and really a, a great thing. I, as a solidarity activist, I'm so happy that I can know what it means to to follow the leadership of Palestinians. Not that there are not Palestinians who might want other things as well, but. Um, all right, uh, a couple things. BDS does not take aside a position on one state versus two states. Again, it's about the rights. It's the idea is that no solution can be sustainable without these three basic rights being met, freedom, justice, equality, which correspond to the three that I talked about. BDS is a nonviolent tool used to address the extraordinary violence of, um, of Israel's apartheid structures. Um, and that's not what the opposition will tell you, right? They'll say, oh God, it's so, it's destruction, you know, they're trying to destroy. This is a nonviolent, time-honored tool used to address violent infrastructure. It's been used, you know, the grapes boycott here in the U.S., um, the Montgomery bus boycott as well. You know, we think about, of course, the anti-apartheid movement. This is thing that we've seen, this is something that we, that we honor, actually, as a society, as a tactic. And we need to keep focus on that message and not let people warp it into something it's not, namely something destructive or negative. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. We should be proud of it. So um, what do you see? I sort of touched on one, which is the centrality of Palestinian voices. What do you see as other things that, that are significant about the, the BDS movement? And if that's too confusing, I can I can start us off. But any, uh, any thoughts to start with? Yes, back there. Anna, sorry, would you please repeat the three rights that you mentioned? Absolutely. Number one, and by the way, you can go to bdsmovement.net. Um, and, and that's the sort of, as much as there is one, the sort of central um, site for the global movement. So, um, so there's tag, the tagline is freedom, equality, justice. So freedom is an end to the occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, freedom. The second one is equality for Palestinians inside Israel. 1948 Palestinians is how they often identify um, equality. And then justice, and that is the right of return, the protection of and implementation of the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Um, all right, so other, what is sort of brilliant or, or need or significant about BDS? Yes. I think it's significant, uh, Anna, that uh, the first part of the call that says, in the occupation, the original statement from the uh, BDS movement said of all Arab land. Oh, and it's, I think it's, is it, that hasn't changed, has it? Well, you just quoted something different. Just oh, I'm, I'm sorry, West it is Bank, of, of East all Arab Jerusalem Arab and Gaza. Uh, yes, different. he's right, he's right, excuse me. So I was talking with regard to specifically, you know, Palestine, but absolutely it also, it also includes uh, Golan Heights and other um, occupied Arab lands. Thank well, you for the correction. it includes all of Palestine. And you can go to um, bdsmovement.net and read the exact call. Thank you. Um, other other things, how about about sort of the significance of and what um, what BDS has brought, let's say, to the movement. How does it change, you know, the climate here? Does it does it feel different to be working on BDS from other things, let's say, that you've done as part of this movement in the past? Yes. Um, one of the things that I find significant, speaking as somebody who teaches on this campus, is the number and quality of world class intellectuals that the BDS movement has drawn to its ranks, everybody from Joseph Massad to Judith Butler, and some of my favorite writers and intellectuals that I try to share with my students are on board. And uh, that's a message that needs to both be disseminated in academe, because strangely enough, even though so many world-class intellectuals are on board, 
Uh, there's a great deal of the academy that does not know that, but at the same time, the wider community needs to know it too. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, I feel that this was uh, kind of academia just and liberals mm -hmm. uh, for years knew it and did not do anything about it. Uh -huh. What I like about it is we are going to take action now. And this is what is important. Yes. Uh, it's okay to talk about problems all you want, but if you don't take action, then it's good as not talking about the problem. Absolutely, I had the same experience, and not to say that there aren't other things that can move people to action, but BDS seems to be particularly good at moving people from words to action, from yes. sympathy to action. It's yes. not enough to be sympathetic. What can we do? And this sort of answers that question. There's things that every single person can do. And it's very empowering in that way. I think oftentimes in the past, we, many of us felt we wanted to do something, but what? So it answers that question, and it's Palestinians who are answering the question. Um, other people, wow, uh, yes. Um, is there, uh, uh, is there any legal uh, activities that you are doing other than the public relations? So this sounds like a question maybe that we can do at the end in the Q&A. Okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, let's see, back there in the hat. Yes, uh, in regards to what this gentleman said, I wonder if there are other people that have name recognition that we could possibly use politicians or actors or you know, whomever they may be to kind of get the message out. That are in support, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to defer quest general questions about moving forward. Um, we're also going to have a BDS training, and I hope actually there's going to be, in fact, I should really say there's going to be time for um, open discussion, which is really important that that was worked into the agenda to sort of explore some of these ideas. But I want to focus now on just sort of in terms of uh, focusing now on BDS as a as a tactic and what it what it has done. Um, the two things that make it most useful for me, I think, are that it's clear and it's unifying. Mm. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it gives me hope because butting my head up against Congress and the White House for all these years, it, it's a dead end. And mm -hmm. there's yes. very little hope. Whereas BDS is something where you can circumvent government and yes. get the people involved to try to make a difference. Yes, I got this one. <laughs> it's so true, it's so true. We're not waiting anymore. We're not begging, we're not asking, we're not urging, we're not, you know, writing letters not knowing where they're ever going to end up. We are proactively um, taking charge, we're taking the reins, and the opposition has to respond to us, and that's what we're seeing, right? You know, they didn't, they didn't seemingly seem to care when we would do call-ins or letter writing, not that there won't eventually be, be a place for that, it isn't now, but... Um, but you know, we suddenly there's there's this kind of incredible um, concern within these you know on Israeli headlines that somehow these little organic you know campaigns run by students and artists and grandparents and bakers and teachers are are catching the attention of the you know of the ambassadors and of, of Israel itself. So it really puts us into a um, a position where we're proactively making a difference, and we don't have to wait anymore because we really don't have much indication that change is going to come. Let's face it, um, from from our government, just like that, or from from Israel itself. Um, and uh, on that on that note, sort of, we do, we start to define the discussion, right? So in the past, the discussion was, okay, is Israel, you know, a democracy or isn't it, or is Israel perfect or isn't it? Now the question is, if you're having a divestment uh, campaign on your campus, the question is. God, is, is Israel bad enough that we should divest from these companies? You know, it totally changes the discourse um, into just discerning sort of what's the correct tactic to take as opposed to is there something wrong? It sort of takes for granted that there's something wrong, which is the way that it should be. There should be no doubt <laughs> there's something wrong. It's so awful. All right, other stuff, Guy, you had your hand up. What uh, was it covered? That being correct. Okay, terrific. Yeah, there's one back there. Um, political science. We're dealing with uh, North Korea at present. It's all over the news because of the threat of war that this country is putting out. Israel is a, almost a mirror picture of this in threatening war throughout the Middle East. And so as we look at boycott and sanction, we are seeing a political science of how we are treating North Korea with changes to their economy to put pressure on them to change. And so for students and for the entire academic community, BDS gives us an awesome political science maneuver, mm -hmm. seeing exactly how we deal with North Korea, we are dealing with another military power mm -hmm. exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. I deal as a uh, computer uh, international religious blogger. 
online. And I have a lot of people listen to me in the Islamic community, but if people are not religious, or if they're zealously religious, I'm going to hit my head against a brick wall. Political science is something everybody is interested in, and that's something BDS offers tremendously. Okay, thanks. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention is um, education. So I have to say that you know a lot of people they want to wait until there's enough you know uh, interest and then maybe it'll be time to start a BDS campaign. What I found is that BDS is single-handedly the best educational device that I have ever encountered. What it does is it actually forces people to become educated who otherwise wouldn't really would sort of avoid it. Suddenly it becomes part of discourse. It becomes controversial. People are reading about it in the media. People are asking themselves questions. It completely. Um, it, it, it reaches a new level in many cases um, of, of education that we, that a tool that, an educational tool that I don't think we had, had seen before. Um, and, you know, how does it do this? So one thing is that it makes it relevant, right? So something that seems far away, yes, we all know that we're all involved, if we're paying taxes, that we are involved. It's not just there, it's here, there are Palestinians here, there are, you know, we've been there, let's say. But it really makes it local and relevant to the general public because it localizes something international. It brings it to the community because let's say you're selling this settlement product in your store. That is a local issue. That is something that is relevant to people here. It's not just learning about and caring about something, something far away. Um, so it brings sort of the injustices that are happening there to here. You have a, a local city contract with Veolia running the RTD buses, which happens to be the case. Um, that is suddenly something that's happening over there. What Veolia is doing over there becomes relevant to the people here. So this, this idea of sort of localizing it makes it so that it's harder for people to say, well, I don't really want to get involved. Well, I don't, it's not really my thing that's happening there. I need to focus on things here. This is happening here. And, and that's really, really very, um, to make that connection with your community can be really very helpful for education. Um, okay, so I'll stop there. Um, but you know, overall, it's, it, 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 in, in sort of an umbrella way of characterizing perhaps all this stuff is that it's really empowering. It, we, we have this kind of power from from the BDS movement. So, um, and uh, and with the solution coming from the grassroots through solidarity with Palestinians. So, academic and cultural boycott. Um, this is one of the I think the most powerful and also the most un uh, misunderstood types of BDS. Um, so in 2004, actually, so the year before the BDS call, um, Palestinian civil society organizations <coughs> issued a call for academic and cultural boycott against Israel. Um, and, uh, and in order to sort of understand maybe the, the rationale behind academic and cultural boycott, which, by the way, is something that has also been used historically, especially in the anti-apartheid movement during apartheid in South Africa, there's nothing new about it. There's nothing sort of uh, extreme about it. If you agree that it should be applied in the past, perhaps this is also a time to apply it. Um, but what's very helpful in sort of understanding the rationale um, is knowing a bit about things like Brand Israel. So Brand Israel was actually an initiative that was uh, sort of conceptualized by an Israeli think tank, the Rayut Institute, perhaps others as well, um, and it's an actual government uh, initiative um, to, um, it, to respond to the fact that Israel's image is deteriorating. Like was mentioned by the previous speaker, these things are sort of passe. People saying, you know, some of the things that Israel, that, that Israel used to be able to get away with saying that people agreed or thought were true, people aren't buying it anymore. People aren't buying Israel's angelic anymore. Now, the new thing is it's complicated. That's, the, that's as, as good as they can get, is it's complicated. <laughs> they can no longer convince anybody that they're not doing anything wrong, which is awesome, right? We've, we've gotten there, and I think that that has to do with the struggle by Palestinians and also by, by solidarity activists internationally. So what are they going to do? So instead of being able to convince people that they're not committing war crimes, because that's getting too hard, they're trying to sort of um, distract people away from that by focusing on Israel's academic and cultural achievements, by what an incredible academic uh, beacon it is, progressive beacon, gay rights, um, environmental, you know, environmentally sustainable initiatives, um, uh, you know, the fact that, that, that Israelis are allowed to speak out and are allowed to, um, you know, do peacenik activities, but especially let's focus on cultural, academic, and technological achievements. These are the, sort of the three ones within the brand Israel campaigns. So what happens is that the, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs Cynically, you know, this is not something that they're just doing willy-nilly, with the express, explicit intention 
of overcoming <laughs> the, the, uh, the image that Israel is coming to have because of its incredible arrogance of thinking it can do what it wants and, 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 uh, and attack the Palestinians. <coughs> it's trying to um, distract from that image, to overcome it with an image of uh, being a progressive democracy, a beacon of these different progressive values, whether it's academic achievement, cultural, environmental, okay? Um, and, uh, and that's where we get, for example, things like pinkwashing. Do you guys know what pinkwashing is? Raise your hand if you know what pinkwashing is. Great, okay. So when you're, when you're sort of whitewashing, but you call it pinkwashing because it has to do with LGBTQ things, um, uh, Israel's war crimes by focusing on what a great haven Israel is for gay, lesbian, um, commu LGBTQ communities, which, you know, look, let's look at, at, that, at, the, at the PQBDS, Palestinian Queers for BDS, and what they're saying. What, where are their rights? Um, and when it's used not because of a, uh, of a concern actually for LGBTQ rights, but in order to uh, distract from the oppression of a, of a group of people is not acceptable. We do not accept those kinds of propaganda um, uh, events, and we actually explicitly boycott them. Um, okay. So all of this shows the way, um, or another way to, let me actually say another way to look at this is that is to recognize a lot of times we think of sort of academia as being sort of its own thing, right? That it's independent. In fact, that's where, you know, so many progressive, so much progressive thought is, is, is nurtured and cultivated and, and is, is central. That's not really the case in, in Israel, arguably not the case in the US, but <laughs> at least in Israel we can say with, with conviction. That's not the case, and then in fact, Academic institutions in Israel are part and parcel of Israel's apartheid structures. It is in Israeli official academic institutions that the settlement, you know, architect architecture is is uh, conceived of. That that weapons are um, uh, are are produced and, and uh, created. Um, you know, not necessarily manufacturing, but where where they're developed. Um, these things are not distinct from each other. And when we realize that, we realize the importance of these institutions separating themselves and from and condemning these, these structures. And unless they do, they are truly, in many very, even very clear and tangible ways, <coughs> complicit in the occupation. And therefore, that's why Palestinians have, have asked us to no longer be complicit with them. In fact, many people who are coming as you know, cultural performers, let's say, let's say you're part of the Israeli official um, Batsheva dance troupe. Again, this is sponsored by the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs as part of a campaign, an explicit campaign. Many times they actually, as cultural ambassadors, have to sign a waiver to say that they are coming as ambassadors, that they will not undermine the desires and messaging of the Israeli government. Sometimes it goes that far. Um, so they're coming as ambassadors. And, and what's important is that you're focusing not on the individual, but the institution. People are not judged when we're talking about academics or cultural performers. They're not judged on their beliefs. You can have the most racist Israeli singer come to town and put on a performance, coming to town individually on their own dime or, or whatever as part of a world tour that has nothing to do with the Israeli government. And technically, according to the BDS guidelines, they're not boycottable. You can have a common sense boycott. You can protest and say this person is a horrible person. But according to BDS guidelines, they're not specifically boycottable. And now, if, uh, however, if you have someone who loves to talk about peace but is coming as an ambassador of the state of Israel, it doesn't matter what they say, they have an institutional tie that, that, that makes them boycottable. So it's really it's an institutional, not individual. Why? Why? Yes. Why what? Why the distinction? Why? Good, good question. Because in the anti-apartheid movement, they didn't make that distinction. It's much more limited. The South African uh, boycott and divestment movement was what's much broader. And what I've heard from Palestinians, Omar Barghouti, for example, from the BDS National Committee, the, um, uh, committee, the way that he um, uh, explains it is he doesn't want to get into, they don't want to get into a sort of McCarthyist kind of thing of judging people's beliefs. Okay, you're a good person, you're a bad person. But to, but to look at the structures that are in place, because it's really not necessarily about individual beliefs, but about the apartheid infrastructure. So that's their, that's their rationale. One of the things about academic and cultural boycott, which, which of course is oftentimes more, um, more uh, uh, controversial, <coughs> is that um, <coughs> I believe it is Israel's weak spot. Oftentimes, it's harder campaigns to, to get across. But ultimately, if you look at the reaction that people have to Caterpillar be, you know, to, to the Quaker Friends Fiduciary Corporation divesting, can you close the door? 
um, divesting from Caterpillar versus a performer not coming and, per and performing in Israel, there's a really big difference. For an Israeli teenager to, to know that, that, uh, that someone that they look up to is not going to come and play in their city um, because of their government's policies, it's radically different kind of reaction. So there's a kind of weak spot. Israel doesn't necessarily care that much about UN resolutions or diplomatic lip service. What they care about is their, is their, is their place often within the academic and cultural world. So it's really something that, that gets them where it, it hurts, let's say. Okay, so I'm, I gotta speed up here. Um, oh yikes, how much time do I have? Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll try to go. I'll try to go quicker. Um, well, so, if you want a shorter break, so, so yeah. All right. But I want people to be able to get their break. Okay. Very quickly, academic um, boycotts have to do with events co-sponsored by Israeli institutions, institutional cooperation agreements, and official representatives coming and speaking as part of academic events. You can look, by the way, at PACB, Palestinian Call for the Academic Cultural Boycott of Israel, P A C B I uh, dot net. I think, if not .org, um, and, and read the guidelines. Cultural can go in both directions. It can be Israeli cultural ambassadors coming here. That would be boycottable. It can also mean US or international performers not going and playing in Israel. Um, normalization is another big part of the academic and cultural boycott. Um, and that is that, um, uh, is that one of the trends now, because you can no longer say Israel is perfect, now it's, it's really complicated and we really just need to hear each other and listen and forgive each other. So the new thing is, dial uh, one of the things is dialogue efforts that seek to publicly sort of reinforce the idea that the issue is, is a lack of compassion and a lack of understanding of each other. And if only people understood each other and accepted each other and agreed to make peace, there would be peace. And it ignores, often explicitly and intentionally ignores talking about the structures themselves. In my mind, it's kind of like if you brought a slave mm -hmm. and a slave master together because mm -hmm. they kept fighting and you really wanted them to get to know each other better and understand each other and, and love each other more. But, he, but let's not talk about slavery because that really hurts the slave master to, to talk about slavery. <laughs> let's just talk about our, our friendship and be friends. And, and really, seriously, I think it's a, it's a, it's a decent parallel. If you're not going to talk about the structures, it, oftentimes it's used to manipulate Palestinians and to actually undermine the cause. Because it reinforces this Western notion that this is just a misunderstanding or, or a cultural issue and not a system of apartheid um, that, that needs to be taken down before any kind of real and, uh, and authentic kind of coexistence can can come about. So the, the, the key word that I think of when it comes to normalization issues and cultural boycott, well normalization in particular, coexistence events, purely about coexistence, boycottable. Co-resistance events, now that's good. If you have an event with Israelis and Palestinians coming together to resist the occupation, to talk about it, to talk about boycott, or to talk about um, ways of uh, other ways of resisting, that is not boycottable, that's encouraged, that's great. So it's about what's the messaging here? Is it about resistance or is it about making peace and holding hands? Okay, uh, I was going to do a little, I'm going to do two, a little um, exercise where I tell you something and you tell me whether you think it's boycottable or not according to the PACB guidelines. So, um, independent screening of the film Five Broken Cameras, a joint project of Israeli and Palestinian filmmakers that exposes the occupation. Uh, boycottable? No. No. Not boycottable. No. Great. Okay. Film festival co-sponsored by the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs showing Checkpoint, a film that exposes human rights abuses it, at checkpoints. Boycottable? Boycottable, yes. Great. It is boycottable. Um, a, an independent Israeli-Palestinian book investigating the Nakba. Boycottable? No. No. Not boycottable. All right. You guys are great. You didn't yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. There's a bill in Colorado they're trying to invest in. Israeli. Is that boycottable? And how do what do we yes. do? Yeah. Yes. And I think we're going to talk about yes. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. What are some of the? Let's see here. I want to make sure I get some of those important things, which I think I will. I wanted to go through some of the different um, campaigns. Um, so let's just very briefly. What are some of the uh, successes that BDS has had so far? Generally speaking, and also maybe tangible successes. Let's just name a few. You can yell them out. Changing the conversation. Changing the conversation, the discourse, right. Mm -hmm. uh, several universities have agreed to do this. 
almost, uh, campus divestment initiatives who, that have had varying degrees of success, including Hampshire College, for example, actually divesting, and then student senate resolutions like at UC San Diego and UC Irvine um, calling on the university to divest. Great. Uh, you can Hampshire, just see all that. Was that Hampshire? Hampshire College, that was in 2009, I think. It touches where it hurts the money. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so and so what are so what are some of the the actual successes that we've seen um, broadly in the religious groups? groups and so does turn. Religious groups. Religious groups. And so does turn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Quaker Friends Fiduciary Corporation, yeah. Mennonite uh, Central Committee <laughs> have both uh, are, are both Solid. divesting, and the Presbyterians almost divest Methodists on the path to divestment. Um, Presbyterians and Methodists and other religious institutions agreeing to boycott settlement products. These are huge things. Faith communities, campuses. Um, Soda Stream is a lot more. Soda Stream. Soda Stream is one of the campaigns I want to just briefly touch on, and I will in a second. And it's getting increasingly popular, and I think it, it has a lot of success. TIA Craft has invested some funds from Caterpillar. Yes, yes, TIA Craft. So MSCI, the Morgan Stanley Capital Investment International, I think, Capital International, um, delisted Caterpillar from its list of socially responsible companies. So socially responsible investments are now divesting from Caterpillar, most notably TIA Craft. This financial uh, retirement fund giant divesting 73 or more than 72 million dollars from its social choice fund of Caterpillar stock. Uh -huh. Huge, huge coup. And, um, and that was due to controversy surrounding Caterpillar. Who created that controversy? Uh, yeah, it was, like no, we did. We, we did this. We did this, yeah. Uh, I, I read uh, a lot of UK activism, and there seems to be some, uh, unlike, well, the, the UK seems to have had some real successes of linking labor groups with the Palestinian issue in, in opposition to Israeli, bringing up Israeli products and things. Like well, dock dock workers and things. So some, some reach out into the, into the labor world in the UK seems to have happened. I don't see that here. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, coalitions being built with labor, unfortunately not as much as we'd like in the US, but certainly elsewhere, with environmental groups, with communities of color. Um, another one, you can just yell the Well, well there have been a concerts that, that have been canceled. Yes. And then and authors who, who, have, who are, you know, agreed not to go. But I think even when they have had the discussion and they do agree to go, or, you know, or, or um, that still means that we're talking about it. So it's it's still you know people hold that against them, or it, it makes people think. So even if it even if um if an artist doesn't honor the boycott, it, it still works to yes. get the word out. Yes, absolutely. Controversy, controversy. I'll talk about that in the training. But controversy is key. Whether or not you actually get the specific goal you publicly ask for, you can meet your you can meet different goals. Um, all right, other other campaign successes. Um, Ahava is on the defensive in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I have a beauty skin product that is uh, manufactured in the settlement. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have a, it's a it's a it's a beauty product made in a settlement. Uh, it's made in a settlement. Um, yeah, Norwegian pension fund divests from Elbit, an Israeli uh, arms manufacturer. University of Johannesburg cuts institutional ties with Ben Gurion University. Major academic boycott success. Olympia co-op boycotts Israeli goods in, in Washington. Yolia successes, yes. Um, yes, Yolia successes, Yolo County in California, uh, the uh, Yolia backed out of bidding on a contract following a uh, BDS campaign there, trying to stop Yolia, this French multinational that is involved in many ways in the occupation, from having a contract there in, in their area. Uh, Agrexo. Agrexo? Agrexo. Yes. In, uh, which is a, a, an Israeli settlement uh, pro of, produce uh, company that also had produce coming from the settlements. They've had, um, the Europeans have had huge success there. I'm going to move on. Um, but there are lots and lots of successes. Yeah, ben and Jerry, you know, making ice cream in Israel. Sorry? Ben and Jerry. So that's, that, I don't, uh, we, I didn't have that under the winds, but I do have that under the different campaigns happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's, uh, there are really, really too many to, to list, and if you get on some BDS lists, you will be inundated with literally every day something is going on. This is huge. This is unstoppable. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing because it brings things locally. It means you can, have, you can have extraordinary international influence by having local successes. Um, but you are part of that international thing. It's really, it's really lovely. Okay, uh, you can go to globalexchange.org slash EAP Economic Activism Project and find a bunch more um, uh, a bunch more successes there or BDSmovement.net. Okay, 
So just touching on a few campaigns for you guys to have on your radar that I think you already know about. So actually, none of this has to be totally new. But Ahava, the beauty product that I talked about before, um, it, one of many things about the Ahava campaign, which is which has become broader and broader around the U.S. and around the world, uh, companies deshelving Ahava, for example, deciding they're not going to sell it either because they are with us or because they don't want the controversy. We'll take either one. Um, uh, but it politicizes the product. It makes it so that 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 these companies know that they're taking a political act just to shelf this this product. That's that's great. Um, dynamic fun, people doing flash mobs, covering themselves with mud, you know, what have you. So that's fun. One of the things we'll talk about in the training is how you pick your targets having to do with whether they're sustainable, including are they creative and dynamic and, and fun. Because um, we, because because that can be a part of this. Soda Stream, this um, settlement product that that turns uh, tap water into carbonated soda water, um, is becoming more and more of a popular target, especially because they're doing this massive PR campaign, um, as, and including during the Super Bowl, they aired a um, they aired a. Uh, commercial. Anyway, this is becoming a very popular campaign. We can talk about it more in the training if you want. We Divest is the national campaign to compel TIA craft to divest from the occupation. We've had at least one really big success so far. It's a national campaign doing shareholder activism, doing uh, work within the SRI, socially responsible investments community. And there's a shift happening right now, actually, shifting from petition gathering and, uh, and statements to TIA craft to supporting local campaigns against the target companies that include Soda Street, that include Caterpillar and, and Veolia, companies that we that, that TIA Prep is invested in. Veolia, um, maybe I'll talk about that during the training because it is it's my favorite, I have to tell you. <laughs> I became obsessed with Veolia. Uh, last year, um, all right. I'll tell you. Can I tell you? Here, I'll, I'll tell you in the. I'll do. I'll turn in the. Tr in the. Uh, oh, the tell us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's easier for you to say, but but that has to stick to the schedule. Um, all right. There's ads campaigns. Did you guys have an ad here? Um, a billboard? Did I? Mm -hmm. Did I? Did I, did mm -hmm. I know? Yeah. 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 Oh, terrific. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. ads campaigns in the U.S. campaign, by the way, has yeah. has several ways that we can be supportive of that, perhaps you're already um, aware. Um, military aid campaigns, of course, you know, we know, as we were saying before, that Congress is not going to lead the way here, um, but creating the infrastructure and, this, and, the, um, and the community to be able to impose that power is happening. Our organization works on it. There are thousands are around the country educating people around U.S. military to Israel. And I have brochures from our organization here if you want to you want to look that up more. I uh, mentioned the churches already, mentioned the campuses, um, and there are other targets, including Caterpillar G4S, which is a, um, a private security company. It might be one of the biggest in the world. It is involved in um, Israeli prisons, uh, holding Palestinian pol political prisoners. It's also very much involved um, in the US prison uh, industrial complex. Um, and so there are actually natural connections to be made with mass incarceration and anti-prisons um, movements here in the U.S. Um, ben and Jerry's, uh, Hubert Packard, anyway, you guys, cultural and academic boycott. These are all um, different possibilities, and we'll talk about the criteria maybe for picking which ones you guys want to focus on or exploring the ones you've already decided to focus on a bit later. So how do you guys fit into, this is the very end, how do you guys fit into the national scene? I, I hope I've given you a taste of some of the national campaigns that, that you guys can be plugging into by finding your local angle, by making it local. But those things, I, what, one of the things the U.S. campaign can do is to take what you're doing locally and, bring, and, and give it a national voice. Broadcast what you're doing, make those connections with other groups around the country and around the world working on them. Um, help to, to resource you and support and, and elevate what you're doing. Um, because what you're doing locally really can have international um, uh, reach. Um, and anyway, we can talk more about it, but I hope that, that people here will, um, if, you're, if your group isn't part of the U.S. campaign, I hope they'll join so that I can offer that kind of support. Anyway, I'll be back, uh, but I'll, I'll let Beth uh, do her thing. <laughs>